welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show, too, by Stephen Gibb. How are you? I'm doing great, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm good. Well, we can finally catch up. Um, so what's really great about you is I was a fan of you without even knowing you in so many different bands. And, and maybe you can get that because, like, also, you're really good with, like, your hairstyle changes, of beard. Like, you're always changing through the years <laughs> and never really paying attention to it. Like, I've been a fan of you, with, like, at different levels through my life and not even realizing, you know, later on who your family is, who I've obviously been a fan of, but, like, I'm like, the first time I heard of you was when you were doing uh, the 58 project with Nikki and everybody. Yeah. Which is a great, interesting project. And then, like, from there, you just kept popping up at everything. Uh, Black Label Society, Crowbar, you know. Yeah, I mean, I you know, Josta, Kingdom of Sorrow, yeah. uh, Saigon Kick. I mean, I, I, I have the, um, one of my favorite things that ever happened to me was uh, about, I'd say about 10 years ago, I was on tour with my dad and I was singing and playing guitar uh, for him mm -hmm. in his band, um, which I've done periodically over the years. Like when I was young, I would play with the Bee Gees towards the end of their live uh, career. Yeah. And then uh, later on when my, when my uncles were no longer with us, God rest their souls, um, I sort of rejoined my dad just, you know, to, to help him uh, carry the legacy on in, in yeah. whatever way made sense for him, you know? So I, I've been very blessed and, and, and I was very excited to go to Australia with my pops because it's Australia and, you know, you don't, yeah. I, I don't care who you are. You don't just go to Australia. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Um, and, and so uh, we were there and uh, it just so happened that uh, my former band Kingdom of Sorrow yeah. uh, was playing in Sydney, the same, well, the day before my dad and I were going to be playing in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And I managed to actually do a, sh a, a, sh a metal show, open it up for Slayer the day before. And the next day I'm on stage with my dad and it's like, wow, boy, do I have an interesting life. Like, and I don't say that to brag, just no. it really kind of threw me for a loop. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool that. You know, and, and to make it even the cherry on the Sunday is me and Jamie Josta uh, during that 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 day, we went to the hotel to go get Kirk Winstein and uh, and we we were we got stuck in the elevator with Colin Hay of Men at Work. And I'm like, dude, this is the <laughs> ultimate Australian experience. You know, like I'll never need a kangaroo this. in there. That's awesome. It, it was he was the sweetest, coolest guy, you know, and, and I'm a huge Men at Work fan. So it's like for me, I was like extra nerded up for that so it was cool man that, that, is yeah. great. that is fantastic i mean that is actually the epitome of like what i've said in the show one of my things is a couple things i say but like there's no such thing as guilty music and i hated that growing up like especially if you're a metal guy you couldn't like and the bgs is gonna be an easy thing to talk about like you couldn't like that because it wasn't cool like whatever but like for me it never was like that and so like i'll be the guy that would have in my playlist would be like slayer and it would be the bgs i was just talking about that like last yeah. week i'm like it depends on what mood i am going to work and stuff so for you to be able to play in both styles and actually play on them is like the world's yeah. best musical academy ever. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, I, I nobody in my family ever took lessons. So everyone in my family self -taught. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they don't know anything. My dad, my dad knows everything, but he doesn't know, every, you know right. what I mean? Like I do know, yeah. Like, you know, rhythmically, like he understands everything about music, but he just doesn't speak theoretically to people right. when he's working on music um but uh you know one of the kicks for me has always been um you know with with my pops is yeah. uh you know like you know like he was never really a, a rock guy himself like he right. likes rock and, and metal music like he gets it but may not necessarily seek it out but, you know, knowing, you know, because I was so interested in it as a kid, you know, I had the very lucky, uh, lucky situation by being his son. I got to meet Kiss when I was very young and see them without their makeup and have the whole kind of, uh, you know, the whole sort of myth of Kiss yeah. was shattered for me very young. But it was amazing. And, and, you know, I still see, you know, Gene and Paul around, you know, to this day and it's it's really cool you know it's it's just I, I don't even remember what your original question was i'm sorry right. but I, I just no. get caught up in the in the stuff 
Well, that's why I really have no, I have ideas that I talk about, but I can't. Because if you start, if you have a conversation, just to a bullet list is kind of boring and lame. You know, no, if you're talking no, yeah, to somebody totally. that you find interesting, like you're, I find you interesting, creative, I've been listening to your music on different levels all these years. Why would I have a bullet list? Like a robot. I could look yeah. it up on the internet or something. You know what I mean? Totally. To, to, well, to converse is more important. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the way I got my start really, um, yeah, I wasn't that great in high school. You know what I mean? Like I, my dad was very honest with me. He's like, let's, let's get real. You, this is not for you, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, I, <laughs> and being that I was the oldest of, yeah. of his five kids, um, you know, him and I agreed that, you know, much to my mother's dismay that me dropping out might be a, an idea. And then, but if I did that, I was going to have to go out on the tour and work for my dad and the brothers and be a guitar tech and not be like running in dad's world, right. but living in crew world where, you know, I was pretty re uh, regularly hazed by uh, the crew guys. And, and I got, you know, I got an education from the ground up of, you know, how do you put a show on? What, you know, how does that work from, you know, the truck's, unloading at 6 a.m. to load out, you know, at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., whatever it yep. was, and then sleeping five, six hours and doing it again. And so I started real young at like 15 or 16 as a touring tech. And um, I was already, you know, I was already obsessed with the guitar and I was like the world's biggest Van Halen nerd back then. And um and I just knew that I, whatever I was going to do was going to be in this world. It, you know, mm -hmm. I couldn't find a more interesting world to right. work in. And I didn't have to, fortunately for me. I didn't realize what challenges would lie ahead. But when you love something, it doesn't matter. You just, you just fucking deal with it. And um, mm -hmm. once I got back from that tour, which was in 89, 90, um, I immediately started playing clubs with my friends, you know, whether it was you know, open mic blues jams to, you know, you know, putting together, I had a bunch of like, you know, starter bands when I was in, yeah. you know, my, my teens, like, you know, I had this band Skillet Head and then Subculture yeah. and, you know, like Subculture, we used to play uh, shows with Manson, Marilyn Manson back yeah. before they were Marilyn Manson, like, you know, so there was a scene down here in South Florida that was pretty great actually at the time um and then i ended up in a band called the underbellies uh in my early 20s that got signed to columbia and subsequently dropped uh due to some issues uh substance abuse stuff amongst the members of the band myself included and um so that didn't work out and that was my first kind of reality check you know i remember that uh when that was done, I was like, well, shit, what do I do now? And so I moved, I moved out to LA with a hope and a prayer like everybody else, because, <laughs> you know, the dirty, you know, the, the thing is, it's not dirty, but the, the, I think one of the big misconceptions about being the son or daughter of someone is that it somehow makes it easier for you to achieve what everybody wants to achieve right now. You may have phone numbers and you may have doors that open, but if you don't have it, you don't have it. Right. And if you don't have it, you don't get to have it. It's kind of, at least that's how it worked when I got out there. Um, fortunately, I did, I did have some inroads uh, uh, th through some friends and through them, I was introduced uh, to Nikki Six and you know, briefly did a little bit of writing and recording with Nikki. It really wasn't, um, he didn't have any plans for it to be like a touring band because Motley right. was pretty active at that point. And, uh, and they had just finished a, a record. I think New Tattoo was the record they were working on at the time. And yeah. um, and around that time, I had reconnected with my old buddy, Zach Wilde, who I'd known since I was probably 14. And I met Zach right when he joined Ozzy's band, purely by okay, coincidence. Okay, yeah. Because I know in, he's from in New a Jersey. hotel lobby, in a hotel lobby in London, England, um, and 
Yeah, I drank my first beer with Zach Geezer Butler and Ozzy Osbourne and Sharon. They didn't know I was super underage, but I was really underage. Um, but wow. it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was wild. And uh, <laughs> him and I stayed friends, and we're still friends to this day. But um, you know, when I when I was living in California, him and I reconnected. We must, I think, we ran into each other at like the Nam show or something. This is before cell phones, so if you, you know, if he changed his number. Or, you know, you know, you just, it was a different world. Right. And, uh, and I, uh, I was hanging out with him and, uh, he was, you know, kind enough to invite me to play bass, which I'd never really played before, but you know, to guitar, it's a easier guitar. It's the way, yeah. it's the way <laughs> I looked at it. It's like, Oh, okay. It's a guitar that you can play while you're drunk. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so, so, um, we uh <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, so you know you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough uh to to play with, with Zach and you know, I mean, he's one of my best buds and one of my heroes. He's just, you know, the best. And we had a you know, we had a blast for I think you know a couple years and and then some of my uh you know substance abuse issues definitely uh got in the way and uh I took some time away, um, uh, you know, met my wife, started trying to get sober, which was a long process for me. It took me a lot of tries, as they say. Um, But during that time, because, you know, I had made friends, really quite good friends with Kirk Winstein from Crowbar while I was doing the Black Label thing, because we toured together. And so when I didn't have a gig anymore, I was offered the, the gig to play guitar in crowbar which incidentally was a a favorite band of mine you know going back to the beavis and butthead days like i saw them on beavis and butthead i was like dude i don't know what this is but i want in and little did i know you know a few short years later i would you know be the guitar player in crowbar which subsequently led to uh kingdom of sorrow which subsequently led to me playing with josta and uh and you know so it's just I don't know. I think that for me, I've always believed that, um, you know, whether it's good, bad, right, or wrong, there are many people that are better at playing the guitar and singing than I am. Um, And there are many people that are just incredible musicians that never really go anywhere. And, you know, everybody's like, well, what's the, you know, what's the magic formula? It's like, nobody knows what the formula is until after it's been cooked. You know, yeah. but in hindsight, I would have to say, be good enough at what you do to where you won't embarrass yourself or your band. So know your shit, yep. A, and B, fucking relax and have fun and be a good hang. Like one of the, the hardest things I think, you know, that I see in a lot of younger musicians and artists now is that whether it's because of the online world or just because of the way the world is now they don't have the same social skills yes that are required at a certain level i mean many of us were handicapped in other ways no but uh, i get i'm I'm 52 we're pretty much both the same age so yeah my kids are like teens and 20s and i get it's different yeah i think it's just it's a matter of knowing what you're doing professionalism to whatever degree you're able to be professional. Um, you know, if, if you're not being professional, hopefully nobody notices. And, uh, and, and most importantly, like, just be a good dude, be honest and work yeah. hard. And, and like, you know, the, the truth is, if you're in a baby band, you're playing a half hour set. Maybe, maybe you get to play a 40, 45 minute set. That's 23 hours left in that day that you're stuck around these people. You know, A, hopefully you like them, and B, if you don't, hopefully you can just be cool enough Mm -hmm. to hang around, you know? I mean, I think that most of the the jobs I've gotten, even studio work and stuff like that, it's because I think people like me. They like being around me for whatever reason. I mean, I don't claim to be the world's greatest guy, but for some reason my personality seems to have gotten me 
pretty far. And, and I think that's because I'm genuinely in love with music and I'm excited about it. Like I'm always like, even if it's a bad idea, I'm excited about how to make it a good idea. Right. You know, like, it's like, there's no bad ideas. There's just ideas that haven't found their footing yet or haven't found a groove yet. And I mean, occasionally there's a bad idea and you just go, okay, that is absolutely horrible. But some of those are even still fun because they lead you to the good idea or they lead you to taking time away so that you can maybe come back re-inspired to come up with a good idea. I don't know. I mean, in all seriousness, I was pretty much like everybody else semi-retired as of a couple of years ago when the world kind of stopped turning a little bit with COVID yeah. and everything you know I wasn't looking to do anything else I was like okay uh maybe I should just start growing my own vegetables and you know move out into the country like I I, I was really there like maybe yeah, maybe this is it maybe I played my last show you know but what I've always loved about you is like you've always been just a musician's musician and you had a chill thing any clips you played is it's not it's never been thought about like who, you, who your family is and what doors have been opened because it's very similar to reminds me of and I have a, a many shows with, with Dweezil Zappa and I got to oh, Frank yeah. Zappa I listened to Dweezil before Frank not like he's Frank fan but the point is he's very grounded also and so about a work yeah, ethic Dweezil's a great and dude being, yeah and being a, uh, we've done like a bunch of deep dives at all his albums super fun like he got a memory like anything that guy um but, but, but to that point, like, it's it's really about your work ethic. And one of the favorite things he'd always say is, and it always keeps coming back in conversations, is Frank would be like, the window or the door? Which way do you want to leave? You know, like, it's like, if you're not being a good member of the band, like, you could have, you want a good person and a decent player that have a celebrity star who's just a jerk. And like, it depends. You just want, you got to be competent, of course. We're not, we're not sacrificing the show, but you've got to be oh, a good Especially in being. Frank Zappa's band. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah. you know what I'm saying? And even Dweezil's band, the same thing is you, you've got to be a good human being. It's, it's not, and that's, even the younger kids in some of these bands now that are playing out, a bunch of bands are, it's a work ethic. There's no more rock and roll, you know, getting drunk and not showing up for stuff. That's not cool anymore. What's cool is being a good guy and showing up and doing the work. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, you know, one time I was, I was, I was having a chat with uh, a dear friend of mine uh, by the name of Tommy Emmanuel, who you might no. Oh yeah, he's fantastic. One, one of the, one of the best greatest. guitar players in the world ever. ever. Yeah, and I'm and I'm blessed to call him a friend. He's a very oh. very generous and beautiful human being that just never fails to inspire me uh, in every way. And yeah. he said something to me one day. I was going through some stuff in my personal life, and we were just chatting. And he said, "You know, Steve, don't forget, we're in the fun business." <laughs> So yeah. if you're not having fun, then you're not doing your job, A. And B, nobody else is going to have fun because you're not transmitting joy. And it really had a profound effect on me because, you know, it's very easy for me at times, and I don't know if anybody else suffers from this, but to think that I'm alone in this world and to think that, you know, somehow I'm a victim. Yeah. It's not true. It's just, you know, it's a lie my ego likes to believe uh, to keep me down in a way, to keep me right-sized, you know. Um, but, you know, remembering why I do this is super, super critical to me. It's like I was the kid with the tennis racket in my room jumping around looking at posters of Kiss and, you know, Ace Freely and, and Van Halen and just like wishing, like I, I knew, wishing that I knew how to express myself like that, you know, like I didn't know that's what I was thinking, but that's what I wanted. I just wanted to be able to express myself with yeah. rock and roll. It's, it's just, I mean, most people get to, if they get to be involved in this business of music, it's maybe for a couple of years, five years, maybe 10, if you're lucky, yeah. if you're really special, you know, 15, 20, 30. I mean, it's incredible to see some of the bands we see now 
doing their sort of end of the run tours that are still around. Like Aerosmith yeah. has just announced a tour and I'm pretty sure this is the last one for them. I think it is. Definitely. And, I definitely think it is. Um, yeah, I, th I think it is too. And I mean, that's incredible. Whatever, you know, whatever it took to get that far, that's between them, but it's, it's admirable. And it it's also incredibly rare. And I don't, I fear that, the generations that are starting to have careers in music, they have long careers, not because they're not brilliant, but because the world has changed, the attention span, the nature of people's bandwidth and what they have available to actually give to the artists they like. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. You know, I just made a record I'm super proud of. I don't know that anybody that I send it to is actually going to listen to it, you know, because I mean, I, I do when my friends send me stuff, I listen to I it because I make the art for me. For you. Right. And, 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 and in this, the, in this particular band that I, that I started kill the robot. Um, like I said earlier, I, I didn't have any grand designs or I'm going to, Oh, wow. I got a new band and I'm going to jam it down everybody's throat. I'm not in that place in my life. It was just one of my best friends, uh, sadly, um, lost his life uh, oh, just over a year ago. I'm sorry about that. And yeah, and, and it was, you know, I would like to think it could have been avoided, but it, 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 it is what happened. It, it's just, that was the result. You know, we lost him. And, um, and he was one of my greatest collaborators and, you know, childhood buddies, and probably one of the most brilliant uh, musicians, drummers, producers, engineers. I mean, the guy was, his name was Brett Thorngren, and uh, his father's E.T. Thorngren, the producer. And, and Brett, uh, you know, Brett was like my, the other half of my brain, the better half of my brain, if I'm <laughs> honest. And, um, and Brett and I did a lot of stuff together over the years. And, 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 him and I used to have a band called Lisbon with a guy named Gil Baton, who is, uh, or Gil Bitten, however people like to pronounce it. Uh, and he's, uh, he used to be the singer for a band called Endo in the early 2000s, which was kind of a, a new metal band of that time that had a couple of, um, a couple of songs that registered and, you know, then they kind of disbanded or whatever. But Gil and Brett and I had a band called Lisbon and, 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 we'd all known each other since we were very young, you know, and uh, it was just fun. And when we lost Brett, Gil was like, Hey, do you want to write some songs? Do you want to do anything? And at the time, if I, if I answered honestly, I would have said, no, I didn't really want to do anything. I was mad. I was mad about losing him, but I knew that there was only one way through it. Yeah. And that was to make art. And, um, and so we, we jumped, right into writing and we probably had about 30 ideas within a month that were good enough to start looking at and we pared that down to about 10 songs um and those 10 songs are going to be the first release from the band kill the robot as a matter of fact as we sit here today uh well we're dropping the leading track tomorrow which is may 4th uh we got a song called atomic haze which isn't a traditional kind of, uh, you know, single release. It's more of mm -hmm. just a vibe so that people kind of get an idea of what we're about. Because if I'm honest, it's nothing like anything I've ever done before. And the entire record is nothing like anything I've ever done before. It has more in common with Tears for Fears than it does with Slayer. And it has more in common with... Uh, um, uh, you know, Black Sabbath than it does Leonard Skinner. You know, it's it's just it's a dark, heavy in moments type of uh, record, but it's um, it's a dark pop rock record with like all your favorite bands from the eighties sort of rolled up into you know one little delicious bula bass, <laughs> and and I and I'm and I'm into it, and I I love I love the songs we wrote. Um, we got together with my, uh, my, my best friend, Warren Riker, who he, uh, 
him and I produced the record together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I have to honestly say that, you know, it's not, it's not anything like, you know, the beautiful thing about making records for me is no matter how it starts out, it always ends up sounding different than anything you could ever imagine. Um, and I, and I love that. I love that process of discovery and I love the, you know, the process of capturing these, these moments of little bolts of lightning, you know, and, uh, and it's a heartfelt record. There's some songs on there that actually mean something, you know, that actually are coming from a real emotional place without being, uh, you know, overtly dramatic. You know, we're just trying to, you know, we're just trying, we're just trying to make art, man. That's all it is. It's really, well, as long as it's, it's real, it's all that matters. I mean, I support an artist making it real. Are you singing? Are you all the singing all guitar in this one? Or... No, I, I, I do uh, some lead vocals on a couple songs on the record. Um, the primary lead singer is Gil, mm -hmm. and I do backgrounds and harmonies and stuff. And uh, I play guitar and some, like, synth uh, type stuff. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I you know, I've yet to make a record with me singing 100%. I know. You're and, a great singer. Uh, you know, I... For the first time in my life, I might actually agree with you. Like I'm, I'm actually getting to a point now where I feel comfortable in my own skin singing. You sound um, fantastic, and I want to say, if I can just button this, put a pin this for one second. People go online and all this stuff we had because you might have realized this. But go in and Google. Gotta get a message to you when you sing. You open up the singing with your father, and your voice how it works with his because you don't have the same voice as anybody else comparative in the family. But your voice is like deeper and stronger, and it's so much emotion. And and yeah. one of the clips I saw, it just it encapsulates it so powerful, which is like chills. And that's that's the point. That's it right yeah. there. And to me, it's frustrating because I'm like, there's not enough like you playing guitar, singing, just doing music out there. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. I've already started working on uh, what will be the beginning of a solo record because. I've made a couple of solo records in the past and I've thrown them away. If I'm honest, <laughs> um, they didn't meet my standards. And, and, and the truth is, is that I wasn't there yet. I, did, I hadn't found my voice as a singer yet. I think I've found it now. Um, and this, this kill the robot project has helped me with that a little bit. Um, nothing. I, I don't think anything helps me more than working with my dad. I mean, that was like getting singing lesson every day. <laughs> of your life. Um, but I think the thing is for me is that for a long time, you know, even when I was a kid, people would ask me, Oh, do you sing like your dad? You know? And I'd be like, what do you mean? Like, ah, you know, no one needs to, you know, like, yeah, it's like, why, do, why do I have to sing like him? You know what yeah. I mean? Like with, with all due respect to, you know, Sean and, and Julian Lennon, their voices are very similar yeah. to their, their pops, which makes sense. I mean, they are related, you know, but it, it, it can be such a burden yeah. for that to always be the expectation. And I told my dad when, when we were doing live shows together and stuff, I said, you know, I can't sing like Robin or Morris. And he goes, no, I know. <laughs> He's like, but I like, but I like, but I like the way you sing. So just do your, I do too. don't worry about anything else. Find your spot and just own it, which we found, you know, the, the the only sad thing for me is that by the time I, I think I really found my voice, he was ready to retire. Yeah. It's my only regret is that, and, and, and I don't regret him retiring. I'm very happy for him that he's happily retired, but I, um, yeah, I'm ready to do, I'm ready to do stuff. You know, the thing is, is if, if I'm honest, I've always, I, you know, if I've always identified as a guitar player. So, um, <laughs> You know, it, it's it's uh, it's gotten to a point now where, sure, I mean, I've been writing and singing and writing and doing all that stuff for years. But usually when I write stuff and I'm singing, I hear somebody else doing it. I don't necessarily always hear oh, really? myself doing it. Yeah. Like, I, I picked this up from my dad. My dad likes, prefers to write a song for someone else knowing the singer. 
Like the reason why Guilty was written the way that it was or Woman in Love or any of those songs on the record was because he had a very specific idea of who the singer was. And he built the song around the voice. Oh, wow. And that's how he's always done it. You know, like even when the seventies, when they were doing, um, you know, the disco stuff, it was like, okay, well, what about if we were, what about if the three of them were the Supremes? What about if the three of them were the Temptations? You know, like how would they create something out of nothing? But, you know, it's the same way that like, you know, I, listen to Black Sabbath still or Kiss or Van Halen. And I go, man, I'll never be able to write anything like that. I love that. But every time I try to do it, it just sounds half ass. It doesn't, it's not good enough. And that's okay because that's, you know, was it the Oscar Wilde uh, quote? Is it Oscar Wilde? You know, just be yourself because everybody else is taken. Yeah, you know? it probably is. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you, you don't need, you know? we don't need another uh, Barry Gibb. We, we had to have him. You can't do better. You can't make a better Barry Gibb than Barry Gibb. You can't make a better Frank Gibb. You can't. Gibb. You can't just don't need to be us. You just need to be you and and have fun, and and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the truth is, is that for a long time, you know, I just felt more. I always just felt more like a guitar player. I've always been a supportive person. You know what I mean? I never was like, oh, everybody, look at me. I'm the dude. Like that doesn't appeal to me. I, the right. the thing with with me, it's like. Like I, I'm really into this because I love music more than anything. The the business and all the other song and dance bullshit you have to do just to participate, yeah, you know, makes makes the good stuff hard to enjoy at times. You know, so you really have to have a thick kind of skin about it and and realistic expectations, and you know, preferably, you know, a a, a well functioning ego. Let me put it that way: a healthy ego. It's gotta be hard though, because I mean, a if you want to be personal, write music and, and share it with people. There's that level, but if you're not worried about being, look at me. Performing is kind of against the not look at me thing, but at the same time, writing music and creating it and wanting to share it is kind of like not look at me. But it's like it's almost like trying. It's like trying to find of like sharing the music and maybe leading some of the emotions in the song without being the center of it, more like being the leader of the traffic, you know. Yeah. that balance of trying to be because then if it's look at me that's why a lot of artists always crash because they don't want to be that they just want to be the musician yeah. that people listen to yeah well you know the thing is too is that I've I've always just been really lucky that I've ended up in bands with guys always that were better singers than me you know so you know you know uh, Zach Wilde's a great singer Kirk yeah. Winstein is a motherfucker of a singer um Jamie Josta uh you know Matt Kramer and Jason Beeler from Saigon Kick both powerhouse singers like incredible singers um obviously my dad and the Bee Gees great singers I just I never felt good enough standing next to those guys I was always like no I'm gonna stay in my lane and do my job I get that just, I mean you know, your whole family sings you know now. I mean it's like everybody yeah, and make, totally. make no mistake, man, be, being a singer, being a singer is a hard job because, you know, what, unless, you know, like you're the guy that can't talk that much when you're not on stage. You got to take care of your voice, you know, like yeah. being a guitar player or a drummer or whatever. It's like, you know, you can scream your head, fucking head off the rest of the day. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it, it, it was, it, it, but the truth is, is that Gil that's singing, for Kill the Robot is another great singer with a really interesting, unique vocal style and and sense of melody. And it's like, you know, it, it's all it's like imagine if Marilyn Manson could really sing. That's kind of what Gail is, in my opinion. But the thing is, is that I like being in bands. Like, you know, some people really enjoy sitting there in front of their computer and playing guitar and singing and they're the band and that's it and and those people i admire greatly but i'm not one of them like for me it's about the collaboration it's about the energies in the room it's uh it's kind of like team sports you know some people like some people like running and that's just they're running against themselves yeah you know and some people like playing football you know and i like being in the game 
I like being part of a gang, a crew, you know, a group of dudes. A well, band. You, musically, you know, well, I think in a band, if you have other people involved and just one person, you're doing one of the best things is you're serving the song. And that's where the best songs come from. You know, it's not yeah. about your ego. Whoever makes the best part, whoever sings, who's going to sing the song out of everybody? Who sounds the best? Who plays this? Like, it's at serving the song, not the notes that go on forever in some songs or the guitar solos that just go forever. You're a guitar player well, or whatever, but you don't need that. Like, no, absolutely. Them. I mean, look, yeah, the song should be the biggest ego in the room, without a doubt. Yeah. That should be, that should be the thing. And, and the thing is, is also, um, you know, like there's there's stuff on on this Kill the Robot record. You know, Gil was like, it would sound better if you sang that. So I just sing it. You know, like and if that's it's perfect, that makes sense. That's serving the song. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I love about Mastodon is that there's yes. three singers. They're all very different, and they're all rad. And they have this. They have very unique voices individually. But together, and, they are the cross. But together, it's metal, like, right? whoa, what is that? Like, yeah. that's, you know, that's a really special band to me. And I'm super stoked because I'm actually going to see them tomorrow night. So right. one thing that's so great about you is I kept, like, I'm like, every time I turn around, I'm like, that's Steven again? Like, I didn't know he was nothing. Like, because you weren't standing out just being like, you know, that solo guy. You're always, always part of, of the band. And not to make the pun, the collective, like I know, because your family, the Gib Collective. But you... Musically, collective is a great word for you because you're always a part of something. Well, besides you know, yourself, I, you know, but I do want you to sing more. <laughs> it's a fan. Well, I, I, you know what? I promise you I will. I, I, you have my word. You have my I word. Do. I, I'm starting I do. to, now, now, now that my dad is retired, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, no, I'm kidding. Um, but the, the truth is, is that, is that, um, uh, like I said, I just really, I just really enjoy being, you know, being a part of stuff. You know, I, I, it's like, if I believe in what somebody's doing, I'm there. I, I don't, you know, I don't even really think about it too much. It's, really it's been a wild ride, man. It really has. Like I was thinking about it during the pandemic. It's like, wow, well, maybe I've played my last gig, you know, like maybe that's it. It's, it's, it goes. What, do you know, what was thing. your show? What was your last show you played? Last show was with my dad. Um, uh, it was a charity event, actually. We did for uh, Chris Everett, the uh, tennis player. She has a charity down here in South Florida. So we did that that show in December of 2019. And then 2020, everything kind of went down the way it did. Prior to that, um, I think the last with my dad would have been Glastonbury in the UK, which was probably a big show. The most uh, mind blowing experience of my life. And, and he claims even his, he said it was really? the most emotionally satisfying hour of his entire life. It was beautiful. It was really incredible. Well, it's, I'll never I think, forget you it. Know, I think as a, as a parent, the fact that you and your father get to share that, it's not beyond the celebrity thing to share that. You know what I mean? You know, I chase my kids. Come on, play guitar. My kids play music. I start playing later in life. I used to do like, bands and sing or whatever, which go from production. But now I don't do that. Like obviously not professionally, but I start playing guitar later on, and it's not that I'm good at all, but I just love it. And you start playing guitar, and you play a song you didn't know before, and you're like, ah, it's kind of boring, kind of lame. You hear it somewhere, and then you play it, and you're like, oh, the chords, the phrasing, that's brilliant. I didn't hear that before. And then it makes you start thinking about other things in life. Am I not hearing other things in life that aren't musical, the wrong way? Oh. Uh. Are you starting to like look at things differently? Because music is like I was telling you earlier is the core for me, and it's like yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm not hearing everything the same. If I'm not hearing that one thing the same, what else? It's all interpretation. Yeah, well, I don't think I've ever heard music the same way twice. Every time I listen to anything, I hear it. With, I don't have the same ears I had even a month ago. I don't have. Like there's, I mean, obviously, you know, every time I listen to, you know, Van Halen one, right. It takes me right back and I'm there, but I hear things in it. I didn't hear before. And, and that's always, you know, the best stuff is the stuff that keeps giving you stuff to think about and feel about. And but also being in a studio that probably makes you think differently too. Like ever since in college, I went to start learning how to do a recording and record. 
my ears change so much sometimes. I'm like, ah, some songs aren't as enjoyable anymore because you're hearing that hi hat. <laughs> you're hearing, yeah, because you're, you're, you're focused in now because you, 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 your ears learn to listen to different things. It's, it's true. Actually, it's true. I have to think sometimes to stop doing that because you got to like just listen to the song. Totally. Well, one of the things I really struggle with is, you know, like when you, you know, if you're in like a, you know, a store or something and they have music playing and like, let's say you're at like a Barnes and Noble or something like that. And you're listening to there's music playing, but you're trying to read. Like I can't read and listen yeah, to music. Yeah. People that do that, like that freaks me out because if I'm listening to music, it's an active, it's right. an active thing. I cannot passively listen to music. Um, and I wouldn't want to, but um, I find that as I get older, <laughs> um, that I don't even really listen to as much actual music. I listen to a lot of ambient things. Yeah. I, one of my, you know, things I enjoy doing, you know, is just like meditating with a guitar in my hands to just create music that isn't, you know, traditional song structure. That's just improvisational and, and, you know, dripping with vibe. Like uh, Devin Townsend has done some really cool yeah. things along those lines. Um, who you know, he's somebody I think is just just incredibly he brilliant. I, I would I would love to shake his hand or work with him in any capacity. But he just man, what a monster! And and what a what a multifaceted, brilliant he's, musical he's, mind he's, he has. Anything he touches, he's just a monster. Anything he does, like he's so good at it. Yeah, yeah, he's he's definitely touched. In a way, it's great. It's great. But I, I love, you know, I love ambient music. I love instrumental stuff. And I love, you know, I, I like to sit and listen to Indian classical music or, uh, you know, music from Africa. Like, I, I, I listen to a lot of weird stuff. And but to me, it's not weird. I listen to the classical. I listen, like, like I said, to tell you, I listen to everything myself. There's music I have to listen to for certain times. I, like I want to mow the yard. I'm driving. I can listen to certain music. If I'm reading or trying to relax, I can't listen to stuff. Some classical I can't listen to because it's too intense. Yeah. Like especially yeah, no, if you listen that, to like, that, that like Renaissance period or some of the classical composers where it starts touching in like an opera and stuff. It's just so much to listen to. and You want to listen to it. You want to honor it. Well, it, the thing is, is that it's demanding. You know, it's music that demands you participate on a certain level. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm not a, you know, musicologist or anything, but you know, you, you think back, you know, when there was, before there was sound reinforcement and PAs and all this stuff, it's like, yep. you know, if you, if you wanted people to pay attention to the music that was being played, you, you had to really, you Work. know, you, you, you know, you, they wrote, you know, they wrote for certain rooms, like they knew yeah. they were going to play, be playing in this environment and they would write with that in mind, you know, it was a different world, I imagine, but, you know, it's, I'm, I'm infinitely fascinated to see how music changes and grows and what people create when they're in a vacuum as opposed to when they're in America. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I, like, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's almost like the more, like I found these, these girls online the other day, they have millions of followers now, but um, I think they're Georgian. So they're, you know, they're out there on a farm with a, they've got a, donkey and they're singing it, what sounds like i guess you'd say it's almost like like it's folk music of their of their um country but almost it's almost appalachian and it's cool. you know it has like elements of bluegrass which i mean look i'm sure they they have the internet because they're uploading stuff to youtube but these girls uh i'm, I'm gonna find you the the um they are yeah but it's voice, how they hear it though their voices yeah. bring me to tears. And one of them is just playing a little something on like, you know, a, I don't know. It's sort of a mandolin, but it's not. I don't know what it is. But the three of them singing in three-part harmony in a language I don't understand is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. And that, you know, goes against everything. Like, I never thought I would be listening to, you know, such exotic music as an adult. But I'm deep deep down some of these holes now because because that's where I, I get inspired you know and 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 get reminded of how you know 
the purity of of music making and songwriting and and uh and expressing yourself through that is like one of the greatest gifts we have as human beings like it like like i said you know you know my 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 dad could even go to you know he could go anywhere in the world and and it, they probably don't understand the lyrics but when they hear how deep is your love they can't stop crying. They can't stop dancing. He writes. You ever hear that phrase "angel chords"? Yeah, yeah it's like, I've heard of it. Yeah, a lot. It feels like a lot of it. I feel like he actually has a patent on it. Like because the chords that he would hit or write in songs, a lot of those songs, and that's why it, it's so powerful to people at so many levels because it's it's beyond it, you know. Yeah. And that's like almost perfect songwriting if you really want. You want people to feel it and, and have emotions. And to people to be a part of them, and you know that's as a songwriter, that's what you want, really. You know, absolutely, absolutely, bro. Um, I want to find you something real quick yeah. because yeah. if I don't remember my their names, I'm going to be really mad at myself. I, you know, I find myself going down the, the on the <laughs> when I do a deep dive on YouTube, it's nothing weird. It's like it's usually some kind of weird musical. And I was like, what are you watching on you? I'm like. Yeah, it's like some of their weird chanting and this language and they're singing in two different voices because their vocals split and they can sing like like David Lee Roth used to be able to do when he was younger, like that voice split yeah. that I'm talking about. Like I get myself. Yeah, that stuff. Those gnarly. those those are, those are, but those are the kind of things I also go down into with different languages and, and, and I keep pushing further out, further out musically. And then what what makes it more enjoyable is and it sounds like like with these girls is they it's so pure because it's what they hear the world's music and then what their interpretation is. But it's really pure because there's no music business behind it. It's just what people think their songs are and their music is, and it's just a camera yeah. and, a, and, a, and a recorder. It's the purest form of music. So these these are these girls here. They're called Trio Mandilli. I don't know if you can see this. Trio. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Trio Mandilli, and they've got they got their donkey along for the ride. These girls are <laughs> incredible, incredible. That could be their tour and bus. My, yeah, their song is the donkey. Kaku Kakuri, I think is the pronunciation. Georgian arts. Yeah, they got I mean they got records, but like I don't know, man. That's how the Bee Gees started. They were just three kids that could sing really, really great together in the middle of nowhere in Australia. And you know, and, and but it, those even those even those early albums though are different than the other ones. But to me, those are those are brilliant albums and overlooked because the songwriting yeah. those were so different for back then. Once again, it was about just it was very pure. Well, there's yeah, I, you know, it, it, well at that time, you know, I think everybody wanted to be the Beatles. So everybody was trying to figure out how to be the Beatles without right. being the Beatles, you know. Um, and I mean, that's the golden. I mean, not the golden age of rock and roll would be you know Little Richard and you know Elvis right. and all that. But after that, it's the 60s, which I guess would make that the silver era of uh, rock and roll. But, you know, the, the fact is, is that, I mean, you look at the amount of, like, the amount of music that came from the 60s and yeah. even 70s. into the 70s a bit. Oh, yeah. But 60s and 70s music is sort of like the stuff that will never die. Singer-songwriter songs. Yeah, you know? just there's something about the the era of music and the, you know, the newfound freedom people were beginning to find through music, particularly in the Western cultures, you know, like it was like America and the UK was really where things were, were happening, you know, and it's amazing. I'll tell my, you know, chat with my dad not that long ago and I go, man, it's, you know, it's crazy. Like you've actually lived through almost like, like basically my dad's watched the birth and now the grunting death rattle of rock and roll on its way out because, you know, just like anything else, it has a lifespan. It turns out it's about, you know, it's probably about a hundred years. It does, you know, you know because... and I would say that, that I'm sorry, artists have like, it's almost like three tiers, right? And actually I, I couldn't apply to your father's band because you have like the beginning part when you're you're and it could, there's no like years involved in, but I think there's like three levels to me. Yeah. And the first one is you're trying to establish yourself. You're fighting. You're clawing. You're getting some hits. Whatever. You're getting established, right? 
and you kind of get known. Yeah. And then the middle level is you're trying to keep a balance with your life and then the career and the music and the, the, the relationships and everything's up and down and crashing or whatever. And that was Aerosmith when they crashed. And then you get your third yeah. level, which I consider the victory lap. And it's not about you're, you're not doing it because you can have the victory lap for 30 years, but you are who you are. You don't have to be anybody else. Yeah. And you're just doing it now at your best level because you want to do it and you owe nothing to nobody. And you have to prove it. Like you are Rolling Stones. You are, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's it. That's who you yeah. are. That's the third level. I don't know if I would say the Bee Gees, I wouldn't know how to do that, how to quantify those, that level with them. I could do it with most every band too. Because of their well, life, I mean, time, they had dips with popularity, but not, but that was with the, the kind of like with the background of disco, but they really always kind of rebounded and always been in the pocket for most people all the way through it though. But, you know, I think that, that with them, there was, it, there was a reluctance about being a quote unquote band. Right, because they were always they they. My dad told me, that, and I've heard him tell other people this too. They never really thought of themselves as a band as much as they were songwriters. So for them, the songwriting was always the number one thing. But you know, above and beyond how great they sang or how great they sang together or individually, mm -hmm. you know, um, it was they were just in love with the the joy of songwriting, and and I think that one of the hardest transitions would be to have the kind of success they had in the seventies and then somehow come back around after that. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, whether it was intentional or not, it was probably the greatest move ever was to just in the eighties be like, all right, we're going to write music for other people. They'd establish themselves as great songwriters and artists, but I know for, for sure my dad was like, nobody needs to see us for a while. We've been overexposed to the maximum. Yeah. And it's just, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to be a dad now. I'm going to be a husband and a you know father and, and just take it easy. You know, I worked really hard. I mean, my dad's been working since he was 10 years old to support his entire family. So, you know, that's, and that's just, so, hey, whatever, you just, you just knocked, you know, just knocked it out of the park. Take some time off and write for other artists, and that was equally as successful. So they managed to somehow trick the industry into keeping them around for an extra 10, 20 years. Um, and they, you know, I think the Bee Gees always had a thing about them that was super cool and maybe not cool at the same time, mm -hmm. like really cool to some people and not cool to others, and. I think that keeps you honest, you know, when you don't just, when you can just make anything, right. you know what I mean? And everybody goes, it's like, look, with all due respect to Beyonce, I don't know her and I've never met her. Right. And I'm, and I don't really listen to a lot of her music. I have heard it. No, yeah, um, nor do I. But, but at this point, you know, whether it's Beyonce or Taylor Swift, artists like that, they can do anything. That doesn't matter how good it is or bad it is. All they have to do is show up and people go, right. She's the greatest. You know, which I mean, is weird for an artist. Which, I mean, Beyonce I mean, could have Chat GPT make her whole next record. Nobody would fucking know. And they wouldn't care. As long as she's up there. Being Beyonce, and you know, right? a lot of artists only sing one line at a time, too, as it is <laughs> in the studio. Exactly. I mean, we're, I we're already pretty much there. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. I remember in college in the 90s recording, you know, it was, it was school for music and recording. And, the, and my producers, because our teachers, we have like regular classes that so we'd have production. I was in Atlanta. And, um, the big thing is my teachers are coming from like recording somebody and I would never put anybody out there, whether I'm a fan of them or not. And they say, I, they would actually say, I'm working on so-and-so's album. It's like an 80s person. And they would be like, um, literally we're putting in words. They're punching in words at a time for this artist because they couldn't do even a single line or a verse. And this was like a known artist, yeah. you know? Um, I can't think of who it is, but there are artists that were doing it then. And that was, well, nineties. So at this point, it's it's off the hook at this point. It's just like yeah. ridiculous. There are people oh. like this. Like I, I, I'll say this, um, Keith Urban. I, I got was fortunate enough to watch him work once, and I actually turned to the engineer and I was like, uh, "Are you are you tuning his voice, like in real time?" And he goes, "No, that's what he sounds like." And I was like, "What?" He goes, "Yeah, he's that good." Yeah, and. That's 
it's more common in, in places like country music, uh, it seems, because, you know, those people, they put in the time, you know, they really do, um, a lot of them. And, 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 and the thing is, is that as much as you can, you know, I mean, look, there are people on the internet now on Instagram or whatever that spend their time in their house and they sing or they play guitar all day and they're great. But the only thing that really makes you great is being in the studio, getting beat up and going out on tour and getting beat up and just ha having to do it, you know, no matter how you feel, you know, I mean, there's, it's, there's been days on tour where I, you know, I got stomach flu or I got this or who knows what, you know, and you still got to go out and make the donuts. I, don't, I couldn't imagine doing that. Like when I have a bad day, I have a bad day. And I'm like, I couldn't imagine going yeah. out there. I, I can, I can get through like as a parent, I I guess from a parent's point of view, I can push through with a smile or whatever when my kids are younger. But now as an adult, I'm like, man, I don't know if I could do it. You know, push through. I have to take a day. I, I don't know if, you know what I mean, for that reason. But to that point, I think a lot of uh, musicians like nowadays, like some big multi-platinum artists were like, they can't get representation nowadays because they're not as popular mm -hmm. because they don't have enough followers. But these followers, these kids, they can do a million takes of their song in their room and get one right. But they're not going to fill a. They're not going to fill a club. Would they have a hundred thousand no. likes? But you're not going to fill a club down the street because you're in your bedroom playing guitar. So yeah, the industry's well. inverted itself to such a weird level now that you know artists at this point, in, in artists of your level, it's really about hundred percent enjoying what you do. You know, yeah. and if you do anything with it, it's great because it's got to be all enjoyment. You know. Well, you know, the thing is, too, man, is that one of the great things about being alive now is, is like, you know, as a musician, you can, you can control your entire existence, you know, like, you know, I, I, I can upload my music and everybody can hear it everywhere. Right. I, can, I can put stuff on the internet and if people dig it, people dig it. You know what I mean? Back when I was coming up, it was, you know, you played a club and maybe 10, 20, 30 people or whatever <laughs> yeah. showed up and maybe they told two friends and, you know, it was like, yeah. man, we grew things a lot slower back then. Don't forget cassettes, um, cassette trading, the third generation. Cassette down, trading was awesome, man. Yeah. TDK, but TDK, but TDK, you buy a five tech, the worst cassettes ever. Well, it's so funny. You just worn it down. Just, <laughs> I was looking at a friend of mine had just released uh, his record on, on cassette. I, I saw and I was like, who the fuck has a cassette player? I I mean I want one, but I don't have I know, one. I don't even have like I have someone sent me that too. I'm like, I'm like, I love you, brother. And mm -hmm. I get the idea about it. I'm like, but I haven't had a cassette player. I don't even have a CD player anymore because of my car. Like I, I'm a record yeah. guy or streaming at this point. If I could do record, I could, but I don't even have anything anymore. Like so yeah. this cassette thing is more just like a thing on my desk now. Because there could be no music on it, I wouldn't even know, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, I'm yeah. sure I probably have one in storage. I should dig it out and see if it works. But, you know, the, the thing is, is like, it, it, there's no good or bad anything. It's just, this is what's going on now. Yeah. It's like, look, I can, even if I have a thousand people, which I'd be grateful to have, you know, a thousand people that give a shit about what I do, that's amazing to me. Like, my band has, you know, not that many followers, you know, and we can't get a deal yet, but I don't want a deal. Well, it's you better know, to be your like, own band nowadays, you know, and if you can focus on your niche, people are getting, I've heard bands say they made more money now, maybe having a thousand to, or 10,000 followers say to a hundred thousand. Yeah. Doing that focus, they've been able to maintain a successful career, make more profit off of that than they could when they were in a record label and they just were making multi-platin albums. Yeah. It's it's because it's how you focus it, and it's different now, you know. Yeah, I but, I also I also find that money and all that crap it just kind of fucks with everything, you know. Yeah. Like just make your art and figure out a way to support your music addiction, you know. Like that's kind of how I have it at this at this point in my life. It's like I do other things to support my desire to continue to be art, you know, artistically fulfilled. If Sometimes when you tie the money to the music, you know, that money comes from somewhere and wherever yeah. that money came from, there's people there that have opinions about, you know, the music and they want to yeah. enforce their opinion to justify their existence, perhaps. And 
I'm not really it's interested in making music so that people can tell me I didn't do it right. I just make what the fuck I make. And that's it. You know what I mean? You don't go to the fucking restaurant and tell the chef, hey, man, I know you really like pasta, but can you just make mine with potatoes, please? Yeah. I prefer <laughs> potatoes. You know, like, that's not to say people should, you know, everybody has food allergies and shit like that. But I'm saying for the sake <laughs> of argument, it's like, I'm just saying for the sake of argument, if Anthony Bourdain, God rest his soul, was sitting in front of you and was going to cook you a meal, you wouldn't start telling him what to put in it. I would not. You'd just be like, and I don't compare myself to Anthony Bourdain, but I'm just saying, I've seen people tell my dad what he should do and i don't think that, they that really is, have that earned is, that right you know it's, it's, it's awesome. great talking to you sean take thank care thank you man. take care okay bye yeah